tree, so our cat. Um, and this cat is allowed to do some kind of physical attacks. So we are considering two types of attacks. So on one hand, we are throwing attacks. Uh, that means that the adversary tries to learn some information about the secret key using um, some, uh, using information about the computation. So for example, through acoustic signals, the running time, or the power consumption. And then on the other hand, we have fault attacks, so uh, the adversary is able to actively influence the computation. For example, through laser beams or electromagnetic forces. And in our model, we say that if an adversary is able to probe a wire, then they learn the concrete value of the wire. And if they fault the wire, they can do an additive fault. So they can choose some delta value that will be added to the value of the wire. Okay, overall, the adversary is able to do D probes and E faults. And to secure against that, we first of all using a secret sharing scheme. Um, so we no longer work directly on the secret input. So for example, in lowercase a, but we work on the shares instead. So uppercase a0, a1, and a2. And of course, the secret sharing scheme should be shown in such a way that it is still resilient against D leaked shares and E faulted shares. And additionally, all the gates of the circuits also have to be transformed. So instead of gates, we are now using these more complex structured structures, gadgets, um, which of course should also be resilient against such faults and probes. Um, our paper started with the idea that we want to use polynomial secret sharing because it has very nice properties when, when you want to achieve fault resilience. However, the problem is here that, well, it can be a bit expensive. So the question is, can you somehow increase the efficiency while it still is secure? And we ended up focusing on circuits that do the same computation multiple times, but on different secrets. So this happens, for example, with block ciphers. And you, are, you can see here the example where we compute eight S boxes. And well, you should be able to compress the computation somehow, right? So our idea is to not embed one secret into one sharing, but to embed two secrets into one. So if you just do like one computation on one sharing, you're basically doing two computations at the same time. So this means that you no longer have to do eight S-box computations, but you can do like four of these slightly adapted S-box computations instead. And this allows us to reduce the computational cost by nearly half. So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna be talking about how we achieve this. First of all, starting by how we chose the secret sharing scheme that we ended up using, and then I'll be talking about how we designed the gadgets for this. Okay, let's start with the secret sharing scheme. Um, and as I said, we want to use polynomial secret sharing. And since the adversary is able to do D probes, then of course learning D shares should give no information about the secret, while if you have more than that, you should be able to recover it. And one way of doing this is the following. You choose some polynomial of degree D and embed the secret in the lowest coefficient. And then all other coefficients are chosen randomly, so they kind of mask the secret. And then the shares are computed by evaluating the polynomial at different support points. Okay, and now um, I have a question for you. Uh, does this work? If you choose a polynomial in such a way, and if you choose the shares, as I just talked about, does this give you a valid secret sharing scheme that is secure against deep probes? And well, I'm asking you, so at least some of you, <laughs> please can say something. What do you think? Does it work or not? Anybody? Do you have some inkling? Do you think it works? Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, and it's absolutely correct. Uh, what I just described is show me a secret sharing, so this is probably what you thought about when I was saying we're gonna do polynomial secret sharing. But there are also other ways of doing this. So, for example, let's assume everything stays the same except for one thing, because now we're embedding the secret in the highest coefficient instead of the lowest coefficient. And well, again, a question to you is, does this still work? Is it still secure? Okay, you're saying yes? And this is absolutely correct as well, uh, thank you. So uh, for example, Lai and Ding showed that this yeah, is basically the same as using the lowest coefficient. So this is also still a secure way of doing this. Okay, then we have a third option 
course. Um, what if we not use the lowest or the highest coefficient, but some kind of middle coefficient instead? And well, this is the last question, I promise. Uh, does this work? So, you're saying no? I heard a no. Anyone else? Okay, well, I mean, you're kind of correct uh, because the answer is it depends. And let's look at an example where this doesn't work. So um, we are in the GF5 and n is equal to three. So the secret is embedded in the middle coefficient. And then the adversary is allowed to learn two shares. And of course, there isn't enough information to actually um, reconstruct the embedded polynomial. However, you can kind of compile a list of all possible polynomials that work with these two shares right here. And while let's look at this, I think you can directly see the problem, right? Because if we had decided on embedding the secret in the lowest coefficient, everything would still be fine because all values between zero and four would still be possible. And the same holds true for the highest coefficient. But there's only a single value possible for the middle coefficient. So of course the adversary directly knows that S is equal to three. So this is a problem, right? Um, and Lai and Ding showed that whether this works or not actually depends on the considered set of support points. So if this nice inequality here holds, so the xi are here the um, support points, then you're good to go, but otherwise problems like the one I just shown you can happen. So this means if you're using the middle coefficient in some a secret sharing scheme, you can't make statements that are as generic as before. And also like on a side note, if you want to do some kind of nonlinear operation, it kind of gets messy. So this is a point where you decide, okay, let's not do this and let's focus on things that always work. So this is like, you can always use the lowest coefficient and you can always use the highest coefficient. So this is the scheme we end up doing. Um, and very simple idea is to just combine the two. So we end up with a polynomial secret sharing scheme where you have one secret embedded in the lowest coefficient and one embedded in the highest coefficient. Um, there's a small uh, restriction here that you can no longer say that D shares give you no information about the secrets, but only D minus one shares do. So, uh, but as we will see, this is like a very small restriction compared to the overall speed up that we will achieve. And this basically just means that for a given um, adversity that can do a fixed number of probes, we need one additional share more. Okay, that means that before that, if you just embed one secret into one sharing, if you wanted to secure these two secret uh, circuits on the left side, then you would end up with these two circuits on the right side. But now by combining the two, we are able to just achieve one circuit in total. And as you can see, well, we have one share more in this version, but it's still less computation overall. Okay, so this now brings us to the second part uh, of how we actually designed the gadgets. And well, let's first start with the shares operations. And as always, they're very easy. So you can just directly compute um, the operation on the shares. So for example, here we want to do an addition. So we want to add the lowest coefficients and the highest coefficients. Um, and this means that you just add up the respective shares. So you add up A0 and B0, A1 and B1, and so on. And well, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. If you add two polynomials, what you're doing is basically adding up the coefficients, right? Okay. So let's go to the more interesting part of the nonlinear operations. And let's start with a small recap on how you would do this with just one secret embedded. So there, generally speaking, you have two phases. So first of all, you have one um, computation that is directly on the shares, and then you do some kind of degree reduction. So for example, here we want to do a multiplication. And that means that first of all, you're gonna uh, multiply the respective shares. So you're gonna compute A0 times B0, A1 times B1, and so on. And the nice thing is that this uh, directly gives you a valid secret sharing um, that already embeds the, uh, the product that you want to compute. However, the problem is that now the degree is too high. So we need this degree reduction step afterwards to get kind of get rid of the highest monomials. Mm. But this is like the basic idea and the basic structure we can also use for our approach. Um, because now it looks like this. So here we want to multiply the lowest coefficient, so A times B, and the highest coefficient, so A prime times B prime. And well, we first of all do this direct computation on the shares, again, so we multiply, 
Um, and the nice thing about using the highest coefficient here is that the product polynomial already contains the product A prime times B prime. So the highest coefficient of the product polynomial is already the product of the highest coefficient of the input. So again, the only step left to do is kind of get rid of the middle coefficient. So this degree reduction step has to, there we can say we want to keep the lowest coefficient, we want to keep the highest coefficient, but it should be of the degree of a smaller, uh, a polynomial of a smaller degree. And well, not only give, do we give um, the algorithm for this kind of multiplication, we also can do other multiplication like the Euler multiplication, and also if you just change like one line in our algorithm, uh, this directly gives you, for example, a refresh gadget, so where you kind of replace or update the random coefficients of the polynomials, or you can also do some kind of decombination. So you can say, well, I want to get a polynomial out of this um, gadget where the lowest coefficient is A and the highest coefficient is B prime. So all of this is possible and it's very easily adaptable. Okay, um, so far I've only really talked about probing security. However, in the beginning I also talked about fault security, right? So let's talk about this one. And also as a side note, uh, this is something I will not be talking about in this uh, talk, but we also achieve combined security. Okay, so the nice thing about using polynomial secret sharing is the following. So we can do, uh, the adversary can do an additive fault. So a share P of alpha I can be changed to P of alpha I plus delta. But this means that because the adversary is only allowed to do E probes, the faulted polynomial, so the polynomial um, if from the faulted and unfaulted shares uh, now has a degree at, at least N minus E. And since we assume this to be larger than D, you can basically just look at the degree of the polynomial and see whether a fault was occurred or not. Okay, so this is very nice. However, the problem is so far, not all of the gadgets actually propagate this error. And to have fault detection overall, we need that this error should propagate to the output. So what is the problem? Well, recall the nonlinear operation gadget I just talked about. Um, there we choose kind of the coefficients that we want to keep. So we can say we want to keep the lowest coefficient and we want, for example, the multiplication example, we want to keep the fourth coefficient. But in this case, we don't check if there is an even higher coefficient that is non-zero. So we wouldn't see whether there was a fault or not. And all outputs of this gadget are ver valid and have a degree of D. So we would lose this error propagation. Mm, how do we change this? So we consider the n minus e to the nth coefficient of the possibly faulted polynomial and use these coefficients to kind of create an error propagation polynomial out of this. So the idea is the following. If no fault occurred, then the polynomial should have a degree of d. So all of the highest coefficients should be zero, meaning that the error propagation polynomial will also be zero, and so nothing changes compared to what we just saw before. However, if there was a fault, then at least one of these uh, highest coefficients should be non-zero, so the error propagation polynomial will have a degree that is larger than D. So by adding this error propagation polynomial um, to the output of the gadget, we now again have the fact that we can look at the degree of the polynomial of the output and just see whether a fault occurred or not. And we can use all of this to have this error detection, and then we can also use the fact for this um, to achieve combined security. Okay, so last not, but not least, we also want to see whether this was just like a nice idea or, or actually practical in the real world. So for this, we computed the number of needed field operations for AES 128 against a T-probing adversary and compared the numbers needed uh, for the single approach, so where you just embed one secret into a sharing with our approach, where you have two. And recall that for a fixed a t probing attacker, we need one additional share, so this is why there's a t plus one in the table. And as you can see, um, our approach already starts to outperform the, the other one uh, for t equal to four, whereas other like f different approaches, for example, the fact secret sharing approach of cross that are only outperform this ver the single version for t equal to 10. So ours yeah, it starts earlier, it's more efficient in this sense. Okay, and this also already brings me to the end of the talk. So um, we, in our paper, we show how to embed two secrets in the coefficient of just one polynomial. 
and you also give different gadgets on how you can actually compute on this. And then, of course, we also provide the security proof um, for this approach, first of all, for purely passive probing attacks, then purely active fault attacks, and then in the end also for combined attacks. Yeah, and that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Are there, uh, are there any questions? Uh, and for the questions, we have two central microphones set up. Uh, otherwise, I can also repeat the question for the people online. Uh, in the meantime, I also have a question. Okay. Um, you said that, um, so the, as you say in the title, you can encode two secrets. Of course, the, the main question I think on everyone's mind is like, can we do more? And it's also that you say in the paper, and you also mentioned that uh, at the present, at the start of the presentation, it's of, of course difficult. Mm -hmm. But did you find some, find some usable structure if you zoom into uh, particular things, like if it's the AES and you want some order of protection, perhaps more secrets are possible? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, the problem is about using or embedding more secrets would probably be if you choose to embed them in the other coefficients then you get the problem that you no longer can use all of the different support points, but you're restricted to the ones that actually work, right? Yeah. And also, for example, if you do like a modification, then you don't have the nice property that you just look at this one coefficient of the product polynomial, but it's all messed up, right? Uh, yeah. So it is kind of getting difficult there. Okay. So I guess the thing for, well, if you want to embed more uh, secrets into one sharing, then I'm guessing the best bet is to do pack secret sharing. So you don't, where you don't embed the secret in the other coefficients, but a different support point instead. So maybe an idea would be to just combine the two. So do some in the coefficients and some in the support points. Okay, yeah, interesting, <laughs> thank you. Question? Uh, thank you for your talk. I have a question. Uh, does it work for non-prime fields? Um, well, we only consider them, so. Um, but I, I'm sure you can also do it for other fields. Okay. Uh, maybe one also quick question. Uh, for yes, which prime field uh, do you use? Oh, uh, well, we considered it to be the X, so you can do prime fields or uh, extension fields. Okay, thank you. I have the other question of, um, I see that in the paper you um, explain the, the general gadgets and, and mm -hmm. um, the efficiency. Um, do you see how to transition this to, to hardware security? So where you say, uh, we're also going to place registers, we're going to look at the robust probing model. Do you think that the mm -hmm. transition is? Um, this is very interesting because we are currently thinking about it. We don't have a concrete idea yet, right. um, but I think this would be really nice to actually go this step further. Yeah. It would be interesting to see. If there are no more additional questions, then let's thank Paula again. <laughs> thank you. And the next talk we have prime masking versus faults, exponential security amplification against selected classes of attacks by Torben Mold, Sayan Dipsa, and Francois Xavier Sander, and Torben will be given the talk. The floor is yours. Um, yeah, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. As Simon already said, this is a joint work with my colleagues Sayandeep Saha from IIT Bombay in uh, India and Francois Xavier Standard from UC Leva in Belgium. And the title of our work is Prime Masking versus False Exponential Security Amplification Against Selected Classes of Attacks. Now, we're in the masking session, so I'm sure you're all familiar with the concept of masking, but as a short recap, what we usually try with masking is to amplify adversarial imprecision. So let's say uh, we have like a sharing and my adversary has like through the power consumption or electromagnetic radiation, a good idea on the probability distribution of some value because the Hamming weight is either zero or one. Um, then he also has like a good idea about the secret. Now if I add more shares, it convolutes the probability distribution of my secret value and I learn less and less information even though I learn the same information per share. 
So as long as my observations are kind of imprecise, I amplify this imprecision through masking. This is like the usual idea. Unfortunately, there is like a caveat, um, especially for like Boolean masking and generally masking schemes in, uh, in binary fields. So here's an example for like additive masking in a binary field, so Boolean masking in green on the left and prime field masking over F2 to the seven minus one on the right side. Both are like from two to six shares. So D is the number of shares. And we have the mutual information on the y-axis plotted over the noise variant sigma square on the x-axis. Both axes are like log scale. And uh, high mutual information means low security. Low mutual information means high security. Um, what I want is like these equidistant steps between my security orders and my numbers of shares. Um, because equidistant steps means exponential security on the log scale. For Boolean masking, I have this problem that I need the some amount of noise to kick off this, this amplification. So I have a very strong adversary who faces like uh, very little noise. Then I have uh, a region where I don't have this security amplification, so I kind of pay the price of masking without um, actually getting the security increase that I want. And this is why prime field masking has been introduced. It started with like a TCC 2016 work by Diamboski et al, where they showed like formally that masking in groups of prime order can amplify arbitrarily low noise levels due to a lack of subgroups in these fields, um, a lack of non-trivial subgroups. And by this, you get exponential security in the number of shares in presence of any non-injective leakage function. That is con in contrast to having non-injective leakage function plus some additional noise, which is usually required. So we revisited this at, at Eurocrypt last year with some information theoretic evaluation, some first practical results, and a toy cipher for like further analysis. Then at Chess last year, we introduced some arbitrary order composable mask gadgets for squaring because in these prime fields, in contrast to like binary extension fields, squaring is like a nonlinear operation. Um, and then this year at Eurocrypt, a couple months ago, there have been two works, one showing that in presence of like Hemingway, like leakage functions, uh, the size of your prime is kind of a security parameter which gets amplified. And um, the other work, we introduced like a family of tweakable block ciphers and particularly a hardware variant, which is called small p square, um, which is like competitive with binary ciphers in this case, with binary tweakable log ciphers. In this case, we compare to skinny mostly. Um, what is this work about? Basically, we are taking the same approach. We look at these prime field mass circuits and see where to get some benefits in terms of fault security. Um, for this, we need to understand three different classes of fault attacks. The first one is differential fault analysis which is like the oldest type of fault attack where you induce a fault in some data operations, then you observe correct and faulty outputs and the differential between these give you information about the secrets. Uh, there are many different flavors of, of DFA in, in literature, but usually you, you need to observe faulty outputs for these attacks to work. Um, so if I have like a redundancy-based detection countermeasure and it works well and no faulty output reach the adversary, there is like uh, you cannot apply this, but you can apply statistical ineffective fault attacks, which don't require observation of faulty outputs. And there we separate between two different types. Uh, CIFAR-1 attacks, you exploit the dependency between the effectiveness of a fault and the value of the intermediate to be faulted. So let's say we have a stuck at zero fault in the LSB. It's obviously only effective if my, if my LSB is not already zero. Um, then we have CIFA2 attacks, which are more operation dependent, and there you exploit a conditional propagation of a faulted value based on some sensitive intermediate. So imagine a multiplication. Uh, we fault one input and effectively, and the output is also faulted unless my other input is zero. So I learned something through the effectiveness of the fault about the other input, and this can also be used for attacks. Now jumping right into the observations that we made for prime field masking. So it's like very simple, additive prime field masking modulo a uh, prime versus Boolean masking where I just X or my shares. And now, as we all know, if I just flip a bit in uh, a single share of my Boolean encoding, I basically effectively flip the same bit in the secret value. 
So there is like no direct security increase that you get from masking uh, because I just need to apply the attack on a single share and it's all fine. With um, prime field masking, you're already losing this very simple property because uh, if I fold a share, depending on my encoding, um, so like for different encodings of the hexadecimal value 6b, um, if I fold, if I flip like the LSB of a single share, it can lead to different faulted values in the underlying secret value after recombination. Uh, so this is the first difference. And the result of this is that even a perfect adversary who is like, can just arbitrarily manipulate bits, he doesn't have full control over uh, the value that is, uh, the fault that is injected in the secret intermediate. And this kind of makes DFA attacks on duplicated circuits more difficult where you need the same fault injection in like multiple instances, either in time or in area. Um, and that effect appears to be exponential in the number of redundancy domains, but the amplification is not really big, so you only have like factor two and scaling the redundancy domains to make this like really hard is, uh, yeah, is, is expensive. Uh, so we mostly focus in this work on the second observation, which is related to CIFA-1 attacks. For a CIFA-1 attack on a mass implementation, you need to bias all shares. Um, and here we consider like a stack at zero fault in the LSB of each share of a Boolean encoding. And if I do this, I directly have the relationship that faults on even secret intermediate values are always ineffective and faults on odd secret intermediate values are always effective. And this is even regardless of the number of shares. If I do the same on like a prime field encoding, I lose this property. So regardless of even value, in this case 6a, or like odd value, in this case 6b, I can obtain uh, ineffective and effective faults while using the same fault injection pattern. So just from the ineffectiveness or effectiveness, I cannot directly exclude what kind of underlying value my secret was. I still learn some biases, but yeah, we will, oops. Here's like a visualization of that. For on the top row, you have like the probability distributions of the secret value. When I do this exact fault pattern of LSB stuck at zero, and we can see that from like the left is one share, on the right is eight shares. Uh, it, it doesn't change for Boolean masking here in blue, but for prime field masking on the bottom, the probability distribution on the secret becomes more and more uniform, which means we extract less and less information. The result of this is that I cannot directly exclude any potential values, and CIFA-1 attacks are less likely to succeed using the same amount of fault attacks and uh, that effect is actually exponential in the number of shares, which is usually something that we, that we like to have because the number of shares is parameters that we can easily manipulate. And um, yeah. The adversary model that we use is called the Heisenberg adversary model. It's not super important because we don't make any formal claims in this model, but to understand what we allow the adversary, it's, uh, it's important. It's a bit clumsy, the definition, so we basically allow almost arbitrary number of faults, stuck at zero, stuck at one, toggle, bit flip, um, with perfect accuracy and precision, or an arbitrary number of faults, but with almost perfect accuracy and precision. I will not go into the details about the meaning of the word almost here, yet that you can find in the paper. The intuition is that we allow multi-bit faults with perfect accuracy and precision in each share, we just have to avoid the trivial attack of faulting all bits in all shares with perfect accuracy because that one gives you um, trivial, trivial attacks independent of the number of shares, which is something that we want to avoid. So in the following, because we are focusing on CIFA attacks, we assume that we have like a redundancy-based detection countermeasure which filters out all the faulty outputs so we don't receive faulty outputs and uh, focus on like using the effectiveness, ineffectiveness information for attacks. How realistic is it even to fault all shares of an encoding? This is kind of, I don't want to make any strong claims here because we don't have empirical evidence uh, for this in the paper. It was also not, not the target. But in literature, there are some indications that this is indeed possible. And two reasons that are given in an ICCAT paper from 22 are um, that the same bit of all shares in a hardware implementation is often processed or stored by gates in very close proximity on a chip or a FPGA 
because basically the same bit, especially if I have bit level masking, uh, go into the same nonlinear gate. So they kind of need some, some proximity. And the second one is, which is often forgotten, that the same bit of all shares may be stored in memory elements, which are clocked by the same clock buffer. So just affecting with a fault injection a single gate, namely the clock buffer, you can affect like a bunch of memory elements and inject a fault. Um, but like I said, we don't have empirical evidence for these things. It's just to motivate that it can be realistic to have such a strong adversary. Um, now for the simulations I will present in the following, we have used a toy circuit because we didn't want to focus on any particular primitives that exist because then they are not comparable. So we have the same toy circuit for Boolean masking and prime masking and it looks like this. We basically inject the fault into P0, then we go through like a matrix multiplication with like the matrix 1, 2, 2, 1. Then we have two S boxes, two key additions, and then the output. Um, the field is F2 to the N with N equals 8 for Boolean masking and 2 to the N minus 1 with N equals 7 for prime field masking and uh, the S boxes are the AES S box and the AES prime S box. Um, basically, the CIFAR attack then works like this. You collect the correct outputs for the ineffective faults and compute back under a key guess up to P0 and then check the distribution of P0. If it's uniform, your key guess was wrong. If it's non-uniform, your key guess appears to be right. And we did this for like up to seven shares on Boolean masking and prime masking in like exactly the same fields on, on the toy circuit that I just demonstrated. And what is plotted here is like the CIFA success rate on the y-axis from zero to 100% and the total number of fault attempts. So that includes the effective ones, the ineffective ones, successful and unsuccessful attempts on the x-axis in log scale. Uh, for Boolean masking, regardless of the number of shares, you don't have any security increase. So, um, yeah, it, it doesn't help you to defend against fault attacks if you increase the number of shares. For prime field masking on the bottom, we can see that we have these equidistant steps on uh, log scale, which means we have an exponential increase in security against this type of adversary. Uh, now, this is for 100% biasing success, so the perfect adversary who gets exactly what they want. This is how it looks like for like 80% biasing success. Biasing success, we mean in 80% of the cases, the adversary gets exactly what they want, and in 20% of the cases, he gets no fault. Um, and this is like, if you compare, there is an offset in both cases, obviously, because I have unsuccessful attempts now, uh, but also the gap between the, uh, the curves on the bottom grows. So like the adversarial imprecision is also amplified in this case. And you can see the same if we are reducing, reducing the, um, the precision of the adversary further. Now there's also a different perspective to look at if you say I have a, a fixed probability of injecting a fault and if I have more shares, I need to succeed multiple times, and those are independent events. So like I have probability P to fault a bit, and then if I want to do that five times for five shares, I have P to five. In this case, you naturally also get um, security amplification for Boolean masking. So here now we also have like uh, steps on the, on the X axis, uh, but it's much smaller than for prime field masking the comparable one. So basically for seven shares on the Boolean masking, you get the same security as for two shares for prime field masking. Um, if I further reduce the injection probability here at 60%, uh, Boolean masking also becomes kind of reasonably secure um, while prime masking grows further and further. Now there, it's, it's important to understand that there are two separate effects at work here. One is, that the distributions become more uniform and therefore less informative. This is shown on the left side. So just the number of outputs obtained for ineffective fault injections on the x-axis instead of all fault attempts. And then on the, on the right side, we have the, the ratio of ineffective faults. So naturally, if I fault a lot, my ratio on, of ineffective faults decreases, right? And here, we can see that, that both effects are exponential. Um, 
Now, if I have two bit faults, so let's say I fault two LSBs in each, um, in each share, then I get much more informative, ineffective faults, but I observe them much more rarely. And this, for like the examples that we have chosen here, leads to a net loss in attack performance. So really the best performance is like stuck at zero or stuck at one faults in a single bit of each share. It doesn't have to be the LSB, it's just a representative, but a single bit, that's, that's important. Um, now this is like, with Boolean masking, if you have like a toggle or bit flip, because a toggle is, is anyway effective, regardless of the underlying value, you cannot basically perform CIFAR 1. For prime masking, we have a caveat, uh, because for even numbers of shares, with LSB toggles, I can actually obtain ineffective faults, and those ineffective faults are also quite uh, informative, but it doesn't work on like odd numbers of shares. And it only holds if I really have uh, perfect unbiased bit toggles. So if my probability of going from zero to one and one to zero is exactly the same, once these differ a little bit, uh, this, this whole thing breaks down basically. However, if you are able to inject these strong faults, we don't have an exponential decrease on the ratio of ineffective faults here. So we only have the one exponential effect, which means like a super strong adversary on even numbers of shares could do attacks with like low numbers of attempts, but still exponential in the number of shares. Uh, now looking at the field size, does it help if I increase the size of my prime? Uh, and the answer is yes, but not as a security parameter that is amplified in the number of shares. So the top row here is uh, for two shares, in the middle for three shares, on the bottom for four shares, and the primes chosen are 5-bit, 7-bit, 13-bit, 17-bit, and 19-bit ones, because those are the Merzen prime exponents. And we can see that the offset, regardless of the number of shares, is kind of constant. So it's, uh, it's not like a security parameter that is amplified in the number of shares, but it's like a constant offset that is like a coefficient in the complexity uh, that we see. Um, now looking at CIFA2 attacks. So CIFA2 attacks are operation dependent, not encoding dependent, which means we cannot really, I mean, they, depending on the operation, they work or don't work. This uh, then depends on your uh, cryptographic implementations that you are trying to protect. Um, and here we have chosen a different toy circuit, which is like two rounds, but basically the same. And we inject a fault into one of these squarings so that the multiplication receives an effectively faulted input, and this one becomes ineffective if the other value is zero. So we have like the typical scenario where we have a value dependent propagation of the fault, which we can use for attacks. And here, what we observed mainly is that although we don't get amplification in the number of shares, because I only have to fault uh, a single share, uh, we do get security amplification in the size of the field. So basically the worst thing that you can do is like bit level masking, and the best thing you can do is, is masking in very large words. This is not always efficient, but I think this is something that, that is good to be aware of. And depending on like my precision of the adversary, so top is 100%, then 80% in the middle, and 60% at the bottom, uh, those attacks are also becoming kind of um, really expensive, so prohibitive to perform in, in practice if I have like a really large prime. So imagine I have like a 30-bit prime or a 60-bit prime, then uh, these kind of attacks really become uh, prohibitive. Now there is more in the paper, I don't have much time left, um, but we have like closed form expressions to predict the likelihood of ineffective faults and estimate the number of outputs needed. We have concrete CIFAR1 complexities for masked AES and AES prime. Um, we also analyze re with regard to CIFAR2 attacks like the problem of non-bijectivity of multiplications and squarings because this is what leads to CIFAR2 attacks. And uh, we provide guidelines on how to construct fault resistant cryptographic circuits over prime fields. And this is basically an overview of our results. So we have two branches for CIFAR attacks on prime field mass circuits, CIFAR1 and CIFAR2. CIFAR1, we have this natural resistance that just exists. We don't have to do anything for that. For CIFAR2, we can either counter it with large field sizes because attacks become prohibitive, 
or I need to pay a lot of attention on how I mask my cryptographic algorithm because I should avoid standalone non-bijective operations. I should avoid um, fault propagation depending on all shares inside my gadgets. So uh, you kind of have like different options on fighting these CIFA 2 attacks. So in conclusion, um, prime field masking offers natural resistance to CIFA 2 attacks and like somewhat weaker resistance to some DFA attacks. This resistance is, is obtained for free when I mask an algorithm over a prime field. And um, yeah, to the best of our knowledge, this is like the first countermeasure that can deliver this exponential security amplification in such a strong adversary model because we don't necessarily limit the number of faults that can be injected. Uh, um, yeah, if you have large enough fields, you can even protect against CIFA 2 or like fault template attacks, which is like a generalization. And uh, the next steps are like building primitives that leverage these advantages nicely. And I mean, there are already enough primitives in crypto that, that leverage um, operations over like reasonably large prime fields. So you have like some already cool properties in, in this regard. That's all. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for the nice presentation. Are there any questions? Um, thank you for the talk. So you showed that uh, for CIFA one attack, you have exponential security gain uh, with prime night skiing where you don't have it with Boolean one. I was wondering if you compare to more generic masking than Boolean, for example, in a product, uh, is it the same or? I mean, a part of the, the, the issues are due to Boolean masking, which like, because it's so simple and because it's XOR based. Um, but generally these, these guarantees you sometimes only get from, uh, um, from, from prime fields indeed. So you can use stronger encodings also in binary fields to counter some of the problems, like in a product masking, for example. Um, but I, out of the top of my head, I, I cannot compare them right now. But uh, what would be your guess? My uh, guess is that you get some of the trade-offs. Maybe you get even some additional ones, but you don't have all of the tra all of the advantages of okay, so it, mask. You think it will be probably not as good uh, as using prime field like this? Probably not. On top of your head, I mean. I mean, you can also combine inner product masking and prime field to, to leverage all of this, right? I mean, sure. it's just the fields that you operate in. You can do multiplicative, inner product, additive, whatever you want. Also polynomial. Um, ah, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? I had uh, one question. You're not exactly working over prime fields, but more over the bit representation of prime field elements. Uh, I know you're working with Mersenne primes because they're more efficient to use, but did you also have a look at other prime numbers or their representations? So the analytical results, which I mostly skipped in this talk, which we have in the paper, they are regardless of the prime. Um, the problem is those are limited to uh, two shares and like faulting a single bit. No, they are not limited to two shares. They are limited to faulting a single bit in each share because once you fault multiple bits, it interacts with the prime and the representation you have of the prime in digital hardware and then it becomes very hard to formalize. Yeah. So uh, we don't have results for like multiple bits per share faulted for higher orders. Um, I also had a, a second question is um, whether you have um, results for, uh, so we saw with DPA that uh, if you inject a fault, the fault might still give an incorrect output, but one that m is less predictable. Um, how would the security, do you think of security amplifications in security models, in security models? So where we typically say, you know, if there is an incorrect um, output, then we already call it wrong. Or how how would the security amplification kind of look there? Or do you want to make a security model out of the kind of randomness of the output? Yeah, so. I'm not so sure. So generally. 
the outputs become a bit less predictable. We were more thinking of the security advantage if you have like simple redundancy list duplication mm -hmm. and you as an adversary try to break this by just injecting the same fault in each of the redundant domains. So that, it will catch. Uh, that becomes more difficult. Yeah. Uh, but also in like, if you only have a single one, the output becomes less predictive. Yeah. But there are uh, faults like Pire Kiskater, fault attack, the, the traditional one on AES. This one is not affected at all, right? Because it's like a structural property of the cipher. So this one, um, if you don't have redundancy, you don't have any advantage from using a prime key. Okay. Then uh, let's thank Berwin again. Okay, and then the uh, last presentation is uh, quasi-linear masking against side channel analysis and fault injection analysis uh, with cost amortization by Claude Carlet, Abdel Rahman Daif, and Sylvain uh, Guia and Cédric Tavernier. Sylvain is giving the talk, and the floor is yours. Okay, thanks for the introduction. So, uh, yeah. Um, what I will, I will be talking today, uh, so is about uh, I think similar topic uh, as the, the, the previous talks. So uh, combining uh, protection against SCA uh, and uh, and uh, fault uh, injection attacks, uh, and uh, doing so efficiently, as as much as possible. Okay. So this is the agenda of my presentation: a quick introduction, the motivation, um, then um, how we. Uh, protect with random masking. I will, I will be fast because we, we already had some some overview. Uh, I'll insist on the Fourier transformation uh, in uh, finite fields and um, give an application to the AES uh, block cipher, <coughs> and then conclude. Okay. So, introduction. We don't do uh, uh, you know protection. Uh, I would say for the sake of beauty or, or science. Uh, we do it because it is required, and actually it is even uh, mandated uh, by some uh, regulation uh, and, uh, and standards. So just to, to give two examples, you see in this uh, slide, right and left, uh, the, I would say, uh, America kind of uh, um, regulation, which, uh, for instance, uh, leverages uh, the FIPS 140, and uh, the, the other side is about uh, the common criteria that is, is much more uh, wor worldwide, uh, I would say, but also a little bit uh, European-centric, okay? And um, so protection against the side channel uh, attacks is uh, now uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, detailed and it, it, it is even expanding, uh, I would say, so even for the FIPS, as you, ca you can see here actually, there will be a, a new revision of the uh, ISO uh, 19790, uh, which will um, which will require actually to uh, to, to do some uh, leakage uh, detection uh, uh, technique as as soon as the uh, implementation uh, embeds some some protection against those attacks. Okay, so this it's the uh, ISO 17825. Okay. Regarding the CC, it's been a common criteria. It's been a long time. Probably you, you are all aware of that. Uh, it's called uh, the inherent leakage of, uh, of the implementation, and so there must be a, a protection. And there's the same uh, kind of requirements against the perturbation uh, attacks. So already today, looking at uh, the, the FIPS, uh, the, the uh, CMVP scheme, uh, there is a requirement starting from level uh, three to be protected against faults. And uh, regarding the, the CC, actually everything is on a single schematic as you, 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 you can see. And uh, so it's, it, it must be, uh, the implementations must be consistently protected against both SCA and FIA. Okay, so it's not one or the other, it's uh, both of them. Okay, so. Um, so let's now dive into the uh, technique. Uh, so my point will be to make those protections uh, efficient as, as much as possible. So let's take a, a, an example. So for instance, uh, I will be talking about AES. So you know what's uh, 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 difficult to, to mask and to share is 
the nonlinear operations. So here I give the uh, expression of the, the uh, sub-bytes uh, operation, uh, limited to one byte. Uh, it's uh, the evaluation of a polynomial uh, with some constants and some uh, then uh, monomials. You see, for instance, you have this x to the power 254, uh, for instance, that needs to be to be computed. This is this is what we call nonlinear operation. Huh? So I cannot do a, an additive sharing of of that and expect that it will recombine uh, correctly. No, it's not the case. So we we need to to, to, to think about that. So. Just giving here uh, uh, in in practice what what it yields uh, on a, a netlist. Uh, so to to compute this uh, uh, x to the power two two fifty six, uh, there will be uh, if if working hard actually uh, to the, we we can uh, limit the number of multiplications, but still there will be four of them. Uh, and so the, 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 the bottleneck is, is really the complexity of those multiplications, and that will be the focus of my, my presentation. Here I show, uh, just for your information, uh, the, the blue thing, the, the refresh, is to uh, manage something which currently I don't address in this work, which is the pr uh, protection in, 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 a, in, in a model which is a robust probing model, but it's, it's outside of the, uh, the technique I will be presenting. So, What's the, the state of the art? The state of the art of masking is that uh, it, is, uh, it is quadratic. Uh, some, some papers actually already discussed about uh, uh, doing uh, better than that, uh, so qu quasi-linear. But just uh, looking at what is available uh, and well known, uh, so take the example of the uh, ISW uh, algorithm for, for masking, you see uh, and you see the, the square over there, so it is quadratic. Huh? You need to compute uh, product, pairwise products of, uh, of shares. And so, uh, uh, so qu quadratic uh, uh, becomes an issue uh, when it becomes an issue when indeed the masking is uh, of uh, high order, okay? Or uh, if we, we want to, to detect uh, faults, so also we will be adding some, some uh, shares uh, dedicated to redundancy. And so, uh, uh, if, if we want now the, the, the two, one, one on, on top of the other, so the number of shares can, can, be, can be large, I will, I will be giving examples, and so we'd like to reduce the complexity. So for that, okay, we know it's all about using the Fourier transform, okay, but it's not uh, straightforward, so I'd like to dedicate a couple of minutes to uh, explain that um, it's not possible in every uh, possible uh, uh, configuration of parameters, so in particular, we won't have the total freedom to choose the number of shares, okay, so at least for this work, huh? so maybe then you, you, you can do better, but uh, so there will, be, there will be a couple of parameters, uh, so the n, uh, n is the number of shares, where we, we will be able to compute a DFT. So what is a, what is a, a Fourier transform? Uh, well, it's a, an operation, you can see it, uh, for instance, as a uh, multiplication by a matrix, so here I, I give this uh, example of the, ma the matrix. Uh, the omega I will be uh, giving more details about uh, this, uh, this element. It's an element of the field we work on, so FQ in general, for, for instance F256, for adapted for AES, but it can be a prime field uh, for uh, whatever crypto you're interested in. I, I, I mentioned about the Kyber, the, the dilithium, etc. Um, so uh, we have this, this uh, matrix M. Obviously, if we compute the Fourier transform using this, this matrix, uh, you, you expect we, we will still have a complexity that is quadratic. The, the, the matrix is a, is a square, okay? Um, so, first of all, before addressing this point, let me just explain that, okay, it's a good thing to have the Fourier transform, then we need to have the inverse Fourier transform. So, what's the inverse Fourier, Fourier transform? Uh, without uh, looking at the technical details, uh, pretty simple, let me go to this uh, slide. Uh, the, the inverse will be, you know, uh, the same matrix basically, uh, replacing uh, this omega by the inverse of omega. And, and actually it happens to work. 
uh, be careful, it's not always the case for uh, Vandermont uh, matrices, but for this specific shape of matrix, it works like that. Okay, so it's possible to go back and forth from the, the spectral of a Fourier representation uh, to the uh, regular representation. Okay, so just uh, introducing the mathematics uh, about that. And then, um, how do we uh, make use of the Fourier transform? So, uh, I want to introduce you a fast Fourier transform. Okay, so it won't be a, you know, the vector of shares multiplied by the matrix, because we know this has a complexity that is quadratic. Okay, so I want to do better than that. And so, we uh, will be making use of a special uh, algebraic structure of the field. And the trick is the following. Uh, the DFT, the, the Fourier transform of, of A, uh, let's call this B. Uh, so it, it is, we, I, I just compute here the, the product uh, ve vector matrix here. And you can interpret uh, this as uh, actually an evaluation of a polynomial. So this P, you see the capital P, P is a polynomial where the, the, share, the input shares, uh, the AI, are the coefficients of the, of the polynomial. And so the, uh, the equation in, 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 uh, in red here uh, says that uh, the coefficient of the discrete Fourier transform, so the BJ, are actually the evaluation of the, the, the polynomial, polynomial P in the omega to the to the power uh, j, okay? Which happens to be actually the reduction of p mod uh, the monomial x minus omega to the j, okay? It just, we, we note that uh, it does not help as such to uh, reduce the complexity, but why is that? Because the reduc polynomial reduction uh, is uh, uh, of complexity uh, n, I just give an example at the beginning of the reduction. Huh? So uh, you see there are n steps, okay? And we must do that n times, okay? So, uh, it does not help. So we want now to do a, a reduction that is faster, okay? And in particular, we don't want to do n parallel reductions. Actually, we will be sharing the reduction uh, amongst the, the, the n, okay? And uh, building uh, actually a tree which will uh, which, which will result in uh, doing uh, obtaining some some uh, some savings. Okay, uh, this is still quadratic. Okay, so what's the trick? The trick is, is the following: consider the polynomial x n minus x. Um, actually, this polynomial uh, can uh, completely split uh, as the the product of x multiplied by all the monomials x minus omega to the i, okay? And then we leverage the property that uh, when you compute p mod, for instance, uh, the product of two monomials, uh, and then you, you reduce with one of the monomials, then it, you, you end up with the reduction of, uh, with, with this monomial, okay? So the idea is to do, um, is to do reductions with uh, not the final monomials, but intermediate uh, uh, polynomials. Okay, so let me, let me explain you this, this thing. Uh, for instance, uh, x, x4 minus x, so uh, it can, can be split as uh, so four monomials, okay, this is the first line, but I can group them two by two, and um, uh, then what uh, I can do to speed up the computation of all the reductions is to start by uh, doing a reduction of P, my input, by the, uh, by the, 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 the largest one, X4 to minus uh, X. So this, this has no effect. But then I will do it for uh, the, the, uh, splitting this, this polynomial into two. Uh, I will do the reduction uh, mode, the, the, the first polynomial of degree two, and the other polynomial of degree two, and then continue uh, uh, with, with the four uh, polynomials of degree one. Okay, so it's it's a kind of tree. Let me. I, I have. I will be. Uh, so trust me for the complexity. Everything is in the 
in the in the paper. I, I like to focus on, on showing how things work. But so at the end, if you look at the index i and j here, the, you see the complexity will be n times uh, log n actually. So yeah. So this, this is in the paper. So just to to to, to show this, let me give you examples here. So, for instance, for, for uh, AES, uh, we can choose different values for, for omega. Uh, depends on uh, the, so no, Q, Q now is, is given, huh? Q is 256. So, for N, we have uh, uh, some, uh, some uh, possibilities, factoring two, 255 into, uh, into uh, so what's that, 3 times 5 times, times 17. 17 okay so we have a couple of, of values to to choose for for omega so here i, I give an, an example and so um what we what you want to do now is the following um, we will be uh, computing in the spectral representation okay so our shares we will turn them into the fourier uh, dft with a dft representation and do the operations in there so Addition scaling, this is linear. Uh, multiplication by the constant is linear. The real problem is the multiplication, okay? And, and then we can go back and forth between uh, normal and, uh, let's say, clear text and masked uh, representations. Okay, let me, let me detail that. that. So, uh, the, so the parameters, I, as I mentioned, lo just look at the n. So there are, there are some values, okay? So if you want a masking, uh, uh, with uh, four shares, uh, but it's not possible. You need to go to five shares, okay? Because because uh, four is not in the in the list, okay? So that's the uh, that's the limitation, I would say, of the approach. So everything is is provided in in this uh, Git uh, Hub uh, repo. Uh, feel, feel free to to have a look. And um, so here I give examples of uh, uh, two examples. For instance, this one, this one of the uh, polynomials that, you, that will be used to do the, the reduction uh, and, um, and so in another form of a tree, okay, so a complexity quasi-linear. And um, so the nice property that you can uh, see from there is that all the polynomials happen to be, it's a little bit cherry on the cake, they happen to be extremely simple. They are called, uh, they are called actually linearized or affine polynomials, uh, so uh, uh, coefficients are uh, very simple, uh, zero or, or, or one. Uh, and um, so with, with this, which is pre-computed, okay, we can then implement uh, the uh, Fourier transform uh, in, in, uh, in the uh, so quasi-linear uh, time complexity. Okay, so. First of all, let me show what happens without what is called co cost amortization. So cost amortization is, is actually referring to the, the, the first talk uh, of, of uh, Paola. Uh, cost amortization, it means that we will be masking together several uh, uh, words of information together. But let me start with one already. So as I said, uh, everything that is related to linear operations, like add addition, scaling, uh, are uh, homomorphically uh, transparent to the masking, so th this is trivial. What is not trivial is the product. So for the, the, the product, actually, here is what we, what we do. Um, we, so, you know, we apply the DFT. This is the, co the complex operation. Then we end up in the masked representation. And here the operation uh, consists in uh, doing the coefficient-wise uh, product so the, the, the mask uh, x times x prime, okay, the two, the two arguments. And then we, we, uh, we subtract the DFT of uh, a representative uh, a polynomial with, with leading coefficients, which, which are zero here. And the rest actually will uh, made up uh, for uh, uh, doing something consistent, uh, so basically we need in the in the clear text to have the to have the the trailing coefficients to be at zero. Okay, and so we, we verify the correctness by applying the inverse DFT, and we end up with with something where we we, we get the correct product 
uh, in the first place. Okay? So this, this, this works without cost uh, amortization with this algorithm here. Uh, the security proof is a simple reduction from code base masking. And why is that? It's because uh, you can see the product, uh, the, the, the DFT, as a product with a matrix. Uh, the Vandermond matrix I was, I was showing. So directly, uh, we can apply uh, the, the result uh, from uh, Wong, uh, Meo, uh, etc. From, from, uh, from UCL team uh, that was uh, presented at CHESS 2020. Okay, so we don't have we don't need assumptions that the, the, the DFT is secure. It, it is obtained by uh, uh, simply applying a known result. Okay? And then now let me go to cost amortization. So uh, we, we, we don't want actually to limit to, to two. We want actually also to mask uh, more uh, uh, in information symbols uh, into uh, the, the when we do the, the DFT. And you see there are multiple actually uh, uh, well, partitions between uh, uh, how many uh, symbols we have. Uh, so this we, we introduce uh, the T, T which is the uh, number of, uh, of information that are, that are masked together. So by default it is one. So by default uh, without cost amortization, you know, we, we put the information into the position zero. The, then the T, the, the D uh, following uh, elements are the random masks, and the, the, the D that follow are, uh, are zero. Uh, and so we can check that they are zero. If they are not, uh, so something happened, uh, typically a fault, okay? But we can do different tra uh, trade-offs, okay? Increase T. Obviously, the security order in terms of side channel uh, uh, will will be less, so it's a, it's a trade-off. Okay, so I show here some some values of trade-off. Okay, for the the values of n again that that you, you cannot choose uh, arbitrarily. Huh? They, are, they are given by the uh, structure of the uh, the the, uh, the number of elements in your field. Okay, that's the way it is. But so you you can you can choose. So it is a little bit uh, uh, variable geometry uh, so scheme. Okay, so. Um, now some results. Uh, first of all, here yeah, we see it is indeed uh, quasi, quasi linear in, uh, in complexity. So here we, we show the, 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 uh, the, the time to compute uh, a a AIS for uh, different uh, masking orders. And you see that the, uh, so it is log log. So the, uh, uh, I would say state of the art quadratic the, the, the yellow uh, curve has a slope of two, if you, if you look at it, whereas our slope is less. And the same for also the use of uh, randomness. You see the, the slope is, is, is less than two. Okay, so it's a, just a experimental validation that it works. It allows also to save area, okay? And uh, so eventually, so making a, making a comparison with a, with a state of the art, uh, we see here that, uh, well, we, we, we are the, the first quasi-linear masking scheme with a fault uh, uh, protection that is embedded, okay? So, concluding, uh, we uh, minimized the, the complexity, uh, leveraging DFT. Uh, it is compatible with cost amortization uh, and uh, uh, is, is compatible uh, compliant or, or let's say co co compatible for the, the, the proof of security with code based code based uh, masking. Okay, uh, you you will see the, the source code as I mentioned. We are working now on showing performance results on uh, uh, so Crystal Skyber. Okay, and I just need to to acknowledge uh, uh, so some funding uh, in in um, in the framework of the, the French uh, bank for investment. Uh, that is uh, supporting our, uh, our work, okay. So thank you, uh, that's it for me. Thank you, Sylvain. Are there any questions?
thanks for the talk. Um, my question is, how flexible is this? So can you apply this to any cryptographic algorithm? Are there like things which make it more efficient, less efficient? So what's like your perfect target algorithm, except AES? Well, uh, it's pretty universal in the sense that if you manage to write, to extrapolate your cryptographic algorithm as uh, uh, additions and multiplications, yes, it will fit. Okay, so. So generally, less multiplications is what you are looking for. Um, well, we, um, uh, we, we, yes and no, because n now the, the multiplication is, is becoming uh, affordable, I would say, so quasi-linear, so it, it's almost the same cost as, as uh, additions. Uh, obviously, you know, it's, it's, uh, you, you need to look also, it's, it's in terms of complexity, it is quasi-linear, but uh, you, you need to look at the, the constants uh, in, in front of it. So obviously, still, it, yeah, the, the, the multiplication is the bottleneck, but a bit less than before. So, you know, the trade-off, optimizing addition versus multiplications is, is a, a bit less than, than it used to be. You know, it used to be that uh, uh, former papers neglected all the linear operations. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's what I was aiming at. Uh, a follow-up question, maybe. Does this incentivize new designs which have more nonlinear operations and therefore maybe fewer rounds? Uh, yeah, this, this is beyond uh, our, our, our capability to, <laughs> to, to propose new algorithms, but w why not? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, could you explain the fork model that you're using in a bit more detail? The security model? The fork model, specifically. Yeah. Ah, fault, 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 fault model is uh, um, uh, uh, simply, uh, it is bounded by the, the, the number of uh, faulted uh, coordinates. Uh, so uh, if, if I can go back here, yeah. Uh, talk, talk, talk. So the, the redundancy is uh, D. Uh, maybe I didn't explain that D is, um, so sorry, the number of shares will be uh, odd, and uh, so we write N as a 2D plus 1, and so we have D uh, symbols uh, for the redundancy, and so we explain in the paper that we can then uh, decode uh, to check syndromes, and uh, so if the syndrome is not null, uh, we, we know there is a fault, and we can actually even correct. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions from people that are not previous speakers? <laughs> In that case, let's uh, thank Sylvain. Okay, Durban thank you very much. And then following the schedule, there should be a coffee break then.